And um, so I think we'll start okay. the webinar at 1.30. And um, so I'm just <laughs> going to make a few uh, technical um, notes for the um, participants. I just, to start, want to welcome oh, everybody online to the uh, second webinar in the series on the use of ecosystem indicators in the council process. I note that except for the members of the ecosystem work group and presenters, participants will be uh, muted at our end uh, throughout this uh, webinar. Please use the uh, hand raise feature, which you'll find on the go to meeting control panel if you want to ask a question or make a comment. I will then recognize you and um, unmute you if that's right. necessary when there's an appropriate break in the um, discussion. <laughs> right, right, yeah. For those um, that... Um, yeah, well, I'll, okay, I take the question back. All right. For those, that aren't, for those that aren't muted by me, please mute your phone or mic until mm -hmm. you're ready to ask a question or make a comment. This will reduce extraneous noise that may be heard by other webinar participants. If, you have, if you're having technical issues with GoToMeeting, call our staff member here, Chris Kleinschmidt, at 503-820-2425. We have one presentation today from Chris Harvey and Greg Williams on biological indicators. The presenters will pause and specifically on the presentation. After the presentation, the ecosystem work group will lead a discussion focused on today's presentation topic. This meeting, including the presentations and any personalized chats you may send through GoToMeeting, will be recorded. Recordings of the webinars and the presentation slides can be downloaded from our website, uh, www.pcouncil.org, and we'll have them posted up on our website pretty soon after each uh, webinar ends. So that concludes just the uh, logistical issues. My over, excuse me, my overview, and. Um, I'm going to turn uh, this over to Yvonne Derenye to uh, have some uh, background information on the Indicator Initiative. Great. Thank you very much, Kit, and welcome, everyone, to our second Ecosystem Indicators webinar. If you attended our Tuesday Physical Ocean Indicators webinar featuring Toby Garfield of the Fisheries Services Southwest Fisheries Science Center, welcome back. And if you're newly joining us for this Biological Indicators webinar, thank you for attending. After Tuesday's webinar, we heard that there might be some confusion on what sorts of reports on or responses to these webinars the Council might expect from its advisory bodies and the public. So I'm going to brief you a little bit on what we know. In September, the Ecosystem Workgroup had proposed holding these webinars during the winter and had proposed that the Council's advisory bodies and the public report back to the Council in March with their first impressions of what they might like to see on ecosystem indicators in the future. And the Council essentially said, well, thanks, but we're already pretty busy in March. So uh, they suggested that we move forward with the Ecosystem Indicators Initiative, but they're not expecting a first full set of advisory body comments until June. So if you're part of a council advisory body other than the ecosystem work group or a member of the public, please feel free to comment in March, but know that that's not the last opportunity and there should be a more thorough council discussion in June, September, or both. We, the Ecosystem Work Group, will have a report into the Council in March summarizing and commenting on these webinars, and we're hoping that our report will help get some ideas bouncing around the Council process <clears throat> so that other advisory bodies and the public feel more comfortable commenting as the process moves on. So having said that, please also feel free to talk about these issues and questions now. We're calling this webinar an ecosystem work group meeting because someone needed to host these sessions and get the conversations going. But the whole point of this exercise is to get as many of your brains as possible thinking about the ecosystem information 
that's important to the many different decisions made in the council process. So what we learned in developing the fishery ecosystem plan was that our work improved when more advisory bodies shared their ideas with us and with the council. So as I said on Tuesday, one reason we're here today is to respond to a suggestion from the council scientific and statistical committee that we hold <coughs> that we hold a sort of broad ranging policy discussion on the kind of information that might be useful to the council's decision making on fisheries management. So that's my long way of saying don't be shy and please do speak up. Um, and now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chris Harvey and Greg Williams of the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Chris is uh, the lead of the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team for the Northwest Science Center, and uh, he's also the lead of the Integrated Marine Ecology Team at the center. And Greg is a member of the Northwest Center's Ecosystem Group in uh, their Conservation Biology Team, or Conservation Biology Division, pardon me. So thank you, gentlemen, both for being here. And with that, uh, please take it away and tell us about ecological components of the California current ecosystem. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, this is Chris Harvey. Uh, I'll make the majority of the presentation, but uh, my colleague Greg Williams is standing by, and we also want to acknowledge the uh, input of everybody on the California Current IEA team. It's contributed uh, monstrously to all of what you're going to see today over the years, and of course to the uh, investigators along the West Coast uh, from whose um, studies and um, time series and so forth we have borrowed. So I want to start by setting a little bit of context for you, uh, analogous to what Toby presented as a, uh, the start of his uh, talk on Tuesday, which is that we are using conceptual models as a, partly as a, a communication tool, but also as a, a series of guidelines for us in terms of how we select indicators and um, which ones we prioritize as most important. Uh, this conceptual model, we've created a, a, a series of them this one's focused on salmon, and you can see it's at a very general level of how salmon are connected to the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, but each one of the conceptual models we've developed uh, goes into a higher level of, of detail. Uh, this shows uh, how salmon are connected to some of the key ecological interactors in the system. Uh, and we can flesh these out even further and look at salmon connections to environmental drivers and human activities as well as the ecological interactions. And we've uh, created conceptual models like this for most of the major species groups uh, in the system. And the important point to, to remember with these conceptual diagrams is not just that we use these as our way of getting onto paper, if you will, uh, <clears throat> what our picture of the ecosystem is, you know, how we think it's structured and how it functions, but also note that any one of these symbols, any one of the boxes or circles, and any one of the links that the lines that connect one symbol or one box to another, any one of those are uh, processes or uh, biomass groups or components that should have an indicator associated with them. So these aren't just pretty pictures for communication purposes, but they're also telling us how we think the system is structured and reminding us that we need to make sure that we have indicators in place to monitor every one of these components and every one of these links. Uh, and that's a critical part to how we make sure that we're looking at every uh, significant aspect of system structure. When uh, we present the indicators, they won't be in those pretty picture forms, but mostly they'll be in time series and just a quick uh, overview of what those time series will look like. You'll see a central uh, data trend indicated by the points and the red lines with a cloud around most of them, not all of them, but most of them we're working toward having this cloud around all of them. And this cloud gives us our 95% confidence that the real value falls within the shaded area. Uh, so uh, more confidence means that that gray sh shaded area is, is closer to the central point and less confidence would mean it's quite a bit wider. The central dotted line is the long-term average of the data and the solid lines above and below uh, represent the um, one standard deviation above and below that long-term mean, so we can see if the if the indicator is within the bounds of the long-term average or if it's above or below it. Finally, we'll have a shaded area, typically the last five years of the available time series, and that green shaded area is accompanied by a symbol that indicates if the trend in the data is going up, down, or neutral, 
and a, a symbol below the trend uh, symbol that indicates if uh, the average over the last five years is within the long-term uh, bounds or if it's above or below it. So this is just a quick uh, symbolic indication of the status and trend of the indicator currently. So let's begin with some indicators of the plankton community, the base of the food web, uh, the indicator that we have been using most for indicating the status and uh, condition of the base of the food web uh, are copepod biomass anomalies that are co collected off of Newport, Oregon. Uh, and we're looking at both the no northern copepod biomass anomaly and the southern copepod biomass anomaly. And uh, biomass anomaly simply means are we seeing a, a relatively average uh, number of copepods or they're more than normal or less than normal? So that, that would be the anomaly. And it's important to look at these two classes uh, because uh, we're looking at the abundances of copepods that are either very high in lipid content and, uh, and energy for predators, and those would be the northern copepods, uh, or ones that are uh, lower in uh, fatty uh, acids and uh, nu nutritional value, and those would be the southern copepods. And so the northern copepods are the better fish prey, and you can see that there are, over the course of time, there are uh, lots, of, of, uh, lots of variability from season to season and year to year, but you can also see that there are times when uh, it's above the, uh, the long-term average and uh, sometimes significantly above the long-term average, and other times where the northern copepods are significantly below very often those are accompanied by uh, the inverse trend for the southern copepod biomass anomaly. And we can see that periodically there are major shifts that are consistent with uh, regime changes in the physical indicators that Toby presented on Tuesday. So most recently in 2014, we saw a shift from uh, an average to slightly above average northern copepod biomass anomaly to a strongly negative one and uh, conversely, uh, a shift from relatively low numbers of southern copepods uh, to a very high biomass anomaly, indicating that a major change in the nutritional content of the copepods had occurred. And we value this indicator because uh, Bill Peterson, who collects these data, has shown that uh, there are good correlations between these northern copepods in particular and uh, the condition of salmon populations in uh, the Oregon production area. And so you can see, for example, here in this trend that as copepod biomass uh, anomaly increases, the northern copepod biomass anomaly increases, then returns of fall Chinook salmon go up, with a very strong correlation. Uh, weaker correlations, but still significant correlations for returns of spring Chinook salmon uh, and for Oregon coho uh, survival. So obviously this uh, indicator is telling us uh, something about the uh, relationship between the, uh, the quality of the prey community and uh, the uh, well-being of the salmon populations. There are other possible plankton community indicators that we could look at, uh, such as total zooplankton biomass, although this is uh, somewhat less informative than those copepod biomass anomalies that are telling us both about the abundance and about the condition. We're also getting into uh, tracking the uh, biomass and distribution and species richness of euphausids. Uh, and still working on getting those data all together. Uh, hopefully those will be available soon. And then finally, uh, we have some numbers on jellyfish abundance off of California and uh, Oregon and Washington. I believe these data are coming from the juvenile rockfish surveys uh, that have been conducted for quite a long time in California, uh, and then a somewhat less uh, period of time, but still a long time now, uh, off of Oregon and Washington. Uh, and you can see uh, that these are uh, quite variable data uh, and that there's a, a break in the time series uh, off California. But these are seasonal data that uh, can be telling us uh, a, a lot about the, the uh, abundance and the variability uh, of these species that are doing something functionally very different in the ecosystem than uh, something like a copepod would be. So next, let's shift to the forage community. And by the forage community, we're talking about <clears throat> a small, say, young of the year fish or small squids or, or krill or things like that that are important food for, um, for fish predators uh, and also for uh, birds and mammals. And it's important to distinguish here that even though we're talking about uh, small schooling pelagic fish. We are not talking about coastal pelagic species in the sense of the CPS uh, fishery management plan. 
Uh, this is not the same as CPS abundance uh, uh, because uh, these are just, for one thing, these are just relative measures of catch per unit effort in surveys off of uh, central and northern waters of the California current. Uh, but these are not assessment results. <clears throat> they have not been put through any kind of uh, rigorous uh, stock assessment style statistics. And this is mainly looking at the forage that's available to predators. And um, so we're largely here looking at um, pelagic juveniles or young of the year of uh, fin fish as well as uh, market squid and krill. And we also have different sampling methods uh, in these two regions in central California and northern California, or the northern part of the California current rather, so it's not strictly uh, safe to say that, uh, that the anchovy numbers in one region are comparable with the anchovy numbers in another region, but it is uh, uh, okay to look at the relative uh, changes in forage in uh, a particular region and look at how they're tracking relative to other forage groups in the same area. So again, this is telling us something about the feeding conditions for uh, larger fish predators, including target species and also protected species. Uh, in the different sections of the California current. You can see, for example, uh, that uh, some species in the last uh, five to ten years have uh, appeared to have gone up uh, pretty strongly in uh, parts of the central California current and in the parts of the northern California current, uh, while other species have remained fairly stable uh, or gone down. Next, we wanna, uh, I want to show you some of our salmon indicators. Uh, for the most part, we have been looking at escapement trends of Chinook salmon from different regions of the California current. And since there are so many populations, as you see listed here in the corner, from central California all the way up to, um, to uh, Washington, uh, it is, um, we've decided to summarize uh, all those data into this quad plot rather than um, putting out 11 different time series plots of abundances. Uh, the, the most recent 10 years in this case, we're using 10 years because uh, of the cohort structure of salmon and autocorrelation in the data. We're using a longer time series. Uh, but those get summarized into a single point, and these points are uh, normalized uh, and also summarized so that you can see that the recent average on the x-axis is either above the long-term uh, average or below the long-term average. And then the recent trend is either increasing uh, up in this part or decreasing down in this part. And uh, there's color coding there to assist. Uh, so this allows us to put uh, a lot of data from a lot of different populations onto one plot and really give you an idea uh, of the general conditions. So uh, we would say that virtually every population in the last 10 years is within its long-term average in terms of abundance. But you have some species or some stocks rather that are, that are increasing, others that are decreasing. There are other data that we could use as indicators for salmon. Uh, those would include uh, measures such as the diversity of the age structure in returning adults, uh, the percent of returning adults that are natural versus hatchery uh, origin, and population growth rates. Whoops. And uh, uh, while these are valuable data, it's important to note that they're patchy. We don't have uh, all of these numbers for every one of the the major population areas that we're, that we're monitoring. But you can also see that, uh, say, for the Central Valley, you have two different indicators here, one of which is going down, another of which is going up. Uh, so hopefully these kinds of indicators can give us some idea of the mechanisms behind changes uh, in abundance that were uh, shown in the previous plot. And then another option that we have is uh, what's, I'm sure, the familiar uh, stoplight chart that Bill Peterson generates. Uh, which is a table of physical and biological indicators that are related to the environmental conditions that coho and Chinook salmon experience off of Oregon and Washington waters. And they're generally color-coded uh, qualitatively uh, that the conditions are poor, intermediate or good, uh, red, yellow, green. And, uh, and this is hopefully a predictive model since these are the conditions that salmon at sea are experiencing right now. Uh, but uh, could carry over to the numbers when those uh, salmon return to spawn uh, and are vulnerable to fishing uh, in a, a year or two. Uh, this process hasn't been formally vetted through the California Current Indicator Screening Process, but it could be done, and in fact, a lot of these uh, indicators here are ones that either I'm presenting today or that Toby presented on Tuesday, uh, so that we're not too far removed from being able to use this 
uh, in a in a, an IEA sense. And then you can see the the value of summarizing things uh, where one year has a lot of red numbers because these years rank very low in terms of uh, conditions for salmon growth, whereas a, a year like 2008 ranks very highly in terms of salmon uh, condi growing conditions. So before we uh, get into ground fish, as Kit uh, indicated, uh, I'd like to pause and see if there are any questions at this point. I don't see anybody um, with their hand raised uh, using the GoToMeeting um, feature. Okay. I see Richard Scully has his hand raised. Richard, go ahead. I'm sorry, Richard. Go ahead, Richard. Hello. Uh, Hello. Can there you, you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. The, my question has to do with the stoplight diagram, and I was wondering if you, uh, if these have been um, prioritized as far as the most predictive for the, uh, uh, the like the rows that go across are, are the ones at the top the most most predictive, and the ones down below less, or is there some kind of way to? Uh, uh, sort these to whether the, the most informative to the reader? Uh, that's a good question. The, um, the ones that are at the top, I believe, are mainly large-scale uh, indicators of temperature. And then the ones in the middle here are uh, directly off of the new. So these are more regional uh, temperature uh, and salinity indicators. And then down here, we're getting into more of the, the biological indicators. So they're grouped by the scale at which they were collected and the type of measure that they are, oceanographic versus biological. Uh, and I don't know, I should uh, ask Bill um, and get back to you on this, I don't know if these are prioritized in any particular order. But what you can see is, so here we have 17 years worth of data. And the year with the highest, uh, say, uh, uh, PDO quality uh, for salmon growth is uh, is ranked number one, and the year with the lowest is ranked number 17. So uh, they're across. You can see how they're updated each year, uh, and then the average of the rank scores uh, forms the final rank score. And then there are some additional analyses down or indicators down here uh, that are, uh, I guess, not part of this index, but they're provided as as support. Uh, to, to further validate uh, the scores from above. I see that um, Deb Wilson-Dannenberg has a question. Um, I, please uh, unmute on your end. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Chris, on that same figure, I guess I was just curious, have you considered doing this for other fishery groups besides salmon, uh, it seems like it has some use, really useful qualities. Thanks, Deb. Uh, good question. Uh, I don't know of other, uh, other populations or species that this approach has been considered for. It wouldn't surprise me if Bill or other colleagues have looked at it, though. And, um, and it, I, I agree with you. It is certainly worth uh, putting together some kind of a compilation of the indicators that we do have to see if they line up in, in this kind of way. And um, uh, a only topic worth exploring with the rest of the IA group. Um, thanks. Just a follow-up follow question on that. Uh, relative to the PCA <clears throat> analysis, I don't recall, was that, did we see that in the report, the annual report? No, this has not been in the annual report. Uh, I think what I wanted to, uh, yeah, there are certainly indicators of this that are in the annual report. For example, the COPEP pod biomass anomalies, uh, the PDO, and, um, and some uh, of the indicators down at the bottom. But uh, we, have not, we have not presented this formally in the analysis. I wanted to just put it out there as an alternative to the things that we have been showing in, in case it's of greater interest uh, to the council, especially given that this 
potentially has some uh, predictive qualities for stocks off of uh, the Oregon coast. I see um, Corey Green has a question. Go ahead, Corey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so I just wanted to follow up on a couple of the points that were made, um, or a couple questions previously. Um, so I think Brian Burke has a really good paper that delves into the importance of um, some of the metrics in Bill Peterson's table. And so I, I saw Brian's on the phone. So if we wanted to get more in detail, he, he could probably comment on that. And the second question was whether there's other populations um, that are, are taking advantage of this indicators-based approach. And um, there's some of that work going on for West Coast Vancouver Islands stocks um, in Canada. And there's a similar approach being developed for Puget Sound. I see Brian Burt does have his hand raised. Um, I'm not, I've unmuted you, Brian. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get one little detail. Um, these are not uh, linked by how well they correlate with salmon. Um, they're more sort of Bill's um, impression of what's important in the ecosystem. And one of the problems is we wanted to keep this consistent, this list of indicators consistent from year to year. And the correlations obviously shift as we get more information. So. One thing we could probably do is, you know, put on the website some sort of indicator of how well these things relate to salmon. But at the moment, they're not ranked; they're not um, categorized that way at all. And, and some are have a higher correlation with salmon returns than others. I see that um, Teresa Labriola has a, her hand raised. Uh, go ahead, Teresa. Thank you. Um, I was actually going to just, you don't have to go back, or you could go back to the forage um, charts. Um, and I, when I look at this, I think about as we look forward towards using indicators and in management, um, how might the list of species need to change or can they change um, either in the list or spatially or temporally? And I don't know if you've thought about how you want, you know, what additional data sets you want in order to, um, you know, take, take our forage indicator and, and move it forward towards management and, and using it other ways. Um, so that was one question I had about how this might change or how maybe the IEA thinks it, it needs to be modified. I think we, we would uh, we would be certainly ready to in, include more species uh, if they suddenly emerge as important within these particular uh, time series and collection methods. We would be we would have to be very careful if we were going to add additional uh, data streams to make sure that the collection the scale uh, spatial and temporal scale of collection uh, you know by different uh, different parts of the water column, different times of the year, and so on, was comparable so that uh, we weren't uh, introducing a bias into the comparison by uh, using a, a method that wasn't at the same spatial temporal scale uh, as these. So it certainly is a possibility, but we'd have to be very careful in how we, uh, how we uh, added additional data. Mm -hmm. I don't that, see any other. That, Go ahead. No, that's it. I, I wasn't sure if anyone was waiting for a follow up because I thought I had a second question, but I didn't. <laughs> okay, then, if there are no more questions and I don't see any hands raised, um, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Deb has a, her, her hand up again. Deb, um, do you want to go ahead? I think you're on mute on your end. I was, but I'm off now. Um, Chris, just to follow up on Teresa's last question, uh, can, can, it, it, 
based on what you just based said, are you suggesting then that all the indicators, indicators from the central the California central current California were collected, collected in the same, in the same manner, manner, although it's different although than, it's different Northern, than California? Northern California? Yes, as far as I know, anyway, the, uh, the data that you see here from Central California were collected in survey with the same methods uh, for the duration of that, uh, that time series. And then uh, Northern California data were, Northern California current data rather were collected from a, a similar type of survey but using different nets and things like that. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised if you want to continue, Chris. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions, too. Uh, so next is groundfish, and uh, much like salmon, we've tried to summarize as many uh, species as possible into one plot rather than uh, just a barrage of different time series. Uh, because we are monitoring and assessing so many different uh, groundfish species, uh, and so this is the way that we've chosen to do it. Uh, we can certainly break this out so that there aren't as many uh, symbols uh, on one uh, plot at a time. But we have flat fishes, rock fishes, and other species, uh, other round fish species in the lasmobranchs that are indicated by the symbols. And then the color of the symbol indicates the most recent year that that species was assessed. And then on the uh, x-axis uh, is an indicator of how uh, abundant the stock is uh, uh, in uh, the most recent year relative to uh, its, um, its um, maximum sustainable yield biomass. So uh, a, a, a fish that's close to one would be one that in its most recent assessment year, it was very close to uh, BMSY. Uh, stocks that are below uh, these red lines down here to the left of these red lines are ones that are in an overfished state. Uh, so you can see the Pacific Ocean perch and yellow eye rockfish are below the, uh, the, um, the reference point, the limit reference point for rockfish, which is this red line here. If there was a flatfish uh, to the left of this line, we would say that that flatfish was also overfished. And then uh, this line up here, this horizontal dotted line, indicates if the current level of fishing uh, exceeds the fishing pressure uh, consistent with maximum sustainable yield. Uh, this isn't exactly uh, a, an indicator of present overfishing, but it does indicate which stocks are being fished uh, heavier than what the, uh, the optimal uh, level would be. Uh, so that might clue us in that, uh, say, in this case, black rockfish, both in California and Washington, are being fished slightly heavier uh, than uh, the, ma the management models uh, would recommend. Uh, and so this uh, rapid summary of lots of different stocks gives us a good idea of the abundance of species and ones that might be uh, sources of management concern, either because of their population status or the degree to which they're being fished. Uh, and we also, because of the extensive survey work that is done along the West Coast, we also have other information for ground fish if the council would like to see those data instead. For example, just the raw abundance data that are coming from the ground fish assessment, and this would include both target and non-target species. And just as an example, here's the, the biomass trends of a very abundant non-target species, ratfish. We can also uh, extract data on uh, the size and uh, maturity of the population, and uh, so this is telling you uh, compared to the, uh, uh, the first year of the survey in 2003, or the first year for which we're reporting data, uh, if the number of mature, or the proportion of mature chili pepper rockfish has gone up or down. It looks like it's starting to go down in recent years, and then this blue line is telling us uh, how big the largest 5% uh, of the uh, chili pepper population is. And so this is telling us that it looks like we have somewhat more large chili peppers than we did in 2003. So these are some other alternative indicators that we have of population condition. And then finally, we can uh, get at some more, uh, perhaps more abstract uh, indicators of the condition of the community as a whole. For example, the ratio of crabs to finfish that are coming out of the uh, bottom trawl survey. And in the long run, we'd also like to be looking at uh, the relative location of the center of the population distribution so we can see if it's moving north or south or inshore or offshore. 
and if any long-term changes in the location of the population might be connected to climate change. So those are some of the alternative ground fish indicators that we, we have um, at, at our disposal. For marine mammals, we have chosen to focus uh, our efforts on just one species, and that species is California sea lions, and specifically uh, uh, indicators of the abundance of California and condition of California sea lion pups, uh, because uh, they're always uh, on land for, for the most part, uh, so they're relatively easier to count than the adults are. They're not migrating all over the place like some of the uh, subadult males are. Uh, so it's somewhat easier to count them than it would be uh, to count the adults. Uh, so this gives us an indicator of uh, indication of uh, the overall population abundance, but we can't just look at numbers because you can see that for the most part at San Miguel Island, where the major uh, rookery is, that numbers have been fairly stable over the last couple of decades. But the condition of the pups, the amount uh, the amount of growth that they've registered by uh, uh, winter. Uh, you can see has uh, in several of the last few years where we know there have been uh, die-offs of pups uh, that growth has been extremely low, similar to the way it was at the last major El Nino. Uh, and so this is giving us an indicator that feeding conditions uh, for the sea lion population around San Miguel Island are very poor uh, and uh, probably is giving us some insight as to what the population uh, abundance of uh, sea lions is likely to do over the next several years as they continue to have very, very poor recruitment classes because these poor growth rates are leading to high pup mortality uh, before they reach age one. For seabirds, uh, this has been a somewhat more difficult uh, set of indicators to track, uh, partly because uh, the, the uh, ability to acquire the time series for many of the species of seabirds uh, has been uh, somewhat difficult due to proprietary uh, uh, issues and uh, data sharing issues. We do have time series for three different species. I just have an example of uh, sooty shearwaters here from May and June uh, in the northern California currents over, um, over about a decade period. Uh, sooty shearwaters are a uh, migratory surface feeder. Common mirrors are a resident uh, diving uh, fish eating bird. Cassin's auklets are a resident diving uh, plankton eating bird, so we have uh, different species, different residencies, and different trophic levels covered here. Uh, but you can also see that uh, there's quite a bit of variability uh, in these data due to the seasonal nature of, of these birds. Uh, and there are also, as far as I know anyway, no uh, comprehensive NOAA-funded seabird surveys on the West Coast, uh, so uh, uh, acquisition of data for these uh, indicators is going to continue to be difficult. Uh, and the limited scope of available da data may contribute to uh, a lot of uncertainty and uh, variability in, in the numbers. So um, the jury is somewhat out on the seabird indicator still. Uh, if we get into uh, questions about this, our colleague Tom Good can, can uh, weigh in. Uh, another indicator uh, possibility for seabirds, and this is one that we showed uh, the council last year, was the number of dead Cassin's auklets that had washed up uh, on uh, the Northern California current uh, beaches over the last uh, couple of years relative to the long-term averages. Uh, so we do have, and you can, the size of the circle here is indicating the extent of the number of dead birds that washed up. So you can see in October and November, the blue circles are indicating a much larger number of birds than the long-term average indicated by the orange circle. So uh, kind of a helpful uh, pictorial uh, way of depicting the, uh, the mortality rates. This could be associated with the uh, warm blob and other climate anomalies we've observed over the last couple of years, but uh, the mechanisms behind this are still uh, to be determined. So we have, certainly we have indicators that things are different in the bird community, uh, but we're still working on uh, sussing out what the mechanisms behind those are. We have, uh, in the ecological data, we also have some notable data gaps that we should acknowledge. Uh, those in particular are with the coastal pelagic species and the highly migratory species. I already mentioned CPS before that we're just moving away from using forage availability uh, as a proxy for CPS and um, focusing more on the forage uh, numbers as indications of feeding conditions for the predator community. Uh, the number of surveys that are specific to coastal pelagic species uh, are somewhat limited. We certainly could go to the sardine and mackerel assessments uh, and coastwide surveys were available for some indicators of uh, CPS population abundance and condition, uh, but uh, we just have not uh, uh, done that yet since we've just recently shifted our philosophy of, of forage fish uh, indicators. 
uh, and that's a that's a very big uh, uh, deficiency in, in our reporting. Same goes for highly migratory species. Uh, we simply haven't uh, put any HMS indicators through the screening process yet, uh, and uh, identifying viable data streams for producing those indicators would be a, a huge uh, benefit for us, and we look forward to interacting with the advisory bodies, the management team, and so forth on uh, identifying what those data uh, might be. Uh, these are certainly focal species groups for the IEA, perhaps not in the indicators, but uh, both are being uh, very closely looked at in terms of risk assessments uh, for uh, vulnerability to climate change and other uh, disturbances, and also looking at uh, modeling of management alternatives for how to most effectively manage the fisheries for these two uh, groups of species. Uh, and again, we welcome any suggestions on good indicators for them. And that brings us to the end of the, uh, of the webinar. And uh, Kit, I believe we can open um, the floor to discussion now and further questions. Can anyone hear me? Yes. OK, yes. good. <laughs> I'm sure people are gathering their thoughts before they raise their hand. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, as I mentioned, um, the members of the EWG are, are not on mute from our end. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so uh, this is Yvonne. Thank you very much, Chris, for going through all of that. That was a lot of detail, and um, certainly, as you know, our favorite species um, being featured. But I wanted to ask you, or I, I guess maybe it's not a question for Chris so much as a question for folks who are listening. Uh, I, I can sort of, this presentation made me see the sort of pros and cons of aggregating a whole bunch of indicators on one page, if you will, versus showing individual indicators and providing a lot of detail. So I was happy to see all of those groundfish species together in one piece, but then um, my eyes were a little crossed by then trying to, you know, suss out all the different details in that. And so I was sort of, if anyone who is on the line has any thoughts on preferences for a lot of stuff aggregated all together or um, spreading out of information. Is there too much aggregated or not enough? If you have thoughts on that, that would be great. I hope I'm making myself clear. I realize I'm just talking out the top of my head here, but um, I think it might be a matter of just sort of personal style, whether you whether you like one way or another. Yvonne, if I could just thank you for that question. Uh, this is uh, a critical uh, issue if, uh, if we aren't able to convey uh, information because the way we're presenting the information causes certain people to just uh, eyes to glaze over uh, and then they miss everything after the slide goes up. Uh, that's a, a, a great failure on our part. So opinions on this are welcomed. Uh, Richard Scully, you have your hand up. I, I do, and uh, I guess I, do, I had a question, and then after Levon's discussion, or Yvonne, I probably have others, but um, the one that I had to, to start with is, uh, as you say, you have no uh, indicator uh, presentation on the highly migratory species, but are there not data from various scientists in the southern area where the highly migratory species are more abundant species-wise that that could be used as indicators or would you have to start from scratch? I, like is there, are there historical data on some of these species uh, that that could be taken from other studies to, to so that you have a, some background rather than just starting with 2017 on a new indicator? 
Uh, thank you, Richard. I'm going to ask uh, Elliot Hazen if he is willing uh, to comment on this, because Elliot is our lead on the uh, HMS uh, species. Elliot, Elliot. I've taken you off mute on our end. I'm seeing you. You appear either to be on mute or you haven't logged in. Well, while uh, while Elliot is being logged on. Um, so we would be able to access or use data uh, for sure from scratch. It really is a matter of allocating the time that could and to vet the indicators. We didn't do that uh, in the early stages of the IEA because uh, our, our our people were um, spread thin and uh, and we put uh, effort into the areas we did. Uh, and we certainly can make up uh, lost ground on that if uh, if the need is there. We would have to be, you know, somewhat careful about these species just because they are highly migratory and to the extent that survey data um, are available to cover those populations at the full extent of their range uh, and distribution is, uh, that's difficult. Uh, and if we saw big dips in their population, would we be able to say that's because uh, the population changed or is that because they just happen to have migrated to a different part of the ocean at the time the survey was conducted? So there are there are certainly issues inherent to these species uh, that make them um, more difficult to uh, to grasp in uh, in a survey framework than uh, something that's a m more of a uh, sedentary or, or resident species. Let me see if Elliot is uh, is available yet, or if there's anyone else from the Southwest Fisheries Science Center who'd like to comment on this. Uh, before uh, I think I'm working now. Sorry, I've have been having audio issues here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, this is Elliot. Um, yeah, I think Chris, you nailed it. The biggest issue is really just the time allocation of, and money to do so. Um, we are trying to work very closely with FRD, the Fisheries Research Resources Division at Southwest Fisheries Science Center to do this, but they are so overtaxed just producing, <laughs> collecting the data and analyzing it for the, the single species stock assessments that we haven't been able to get it into the IEA. But we hope that once the windfall of money comes down from Congress, that HMS will be one of our next, um, is one of our next highest priorities. This is Yvonne. I think, Yvonne, you, know, I think you know, there were some good points raised here about um, needing input from participants in the council process who work specifically on highly migratory species or on their fisheries because, as Chris mentioned, um, they do range so far and there are um, many highly migratory species in the larger Pacific Ocean that only visit us very briefly. So uh, it would be helpful, I suspect, to our science centers to have some kind of prioritizing. I think we all you know, automatically think of albacore as being important, but what other sorts of species within the highly migratory group um, that are important for thinking about in the ecosystem context, we definitely need to dig into um, council expertise. And this is Elliot. I could not agree with that comment more, so I really appreciate that, Yvonne. Deb. Uh, you have your hand up. Do you want to say something? Um, I did. I wanted to go back to um, Yvonne's earlier uh, comment or question about <clears throat> some of the different formats for presenting information and and how and when they're useful or not. And I I think that's a challenging question to answer because I think it depends on what it is you want to know. And it seemed to me, for instance, the groundfish one, yes, I can see the the option for glazing over and because <laughs> there's a lot of information in there. On the other hand, if at one point in time you want to be able to look and see how those different groundfish are doing relative to their reference points, it's kind of a nice condensed way to do that. On the other hand, if you're looking at um, 
if you want to look at you know long-term trend in a particular species because you're comparing it to some of the other um, oceanographic indicators or forage indicators, something like that, obviously that isn't going to be as, us as useful an approach. At least that's my perspective on it. Thank you, Deb. Uh, so, w did uh, did you feel the same way about the salmon uh, quad plot? Let me uh, let me just wake that one back up. Yeah, we we sometimes call that the New York Times, it's like a stock index, sort of leading and lagging, <laughs> right? Um, I, you know, I, I yeah, I did. I I picked the ground fish example because that was the one that Yvonne brought up. I I would I I would agree. Um, the same thing, but I would kind of also defer to some of the salmon folks because I know some of them are on the call, and I'm not sure how they would probably be using that one more as a as an on the spot indicator than I would. Corey, uh, you Corey Niles, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Kit. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So a couple um, smaller picture things, kind of, kind of a first following off on um, this discussion about lumping things together or not. Slightly different angle, though. Have you all looked at? I don't know how to describe them. Reporting, like aggregate statistics, for example. You know, all of, a lot of our, our conservation objectives are overfishing objectives, are really species by species. But I've seen some studies take like a a higher level view of, for example, how much of the biomass are you removing from the total system each year? So, like looking at ground fish, could you could you come up with something like that that um, combines all the species into one measure? Um, and like question: Have you thought about that? And and second, just a suggestion. I know I'm pretty sure all three states on the seabirds run run a nearshore survey. I think focused mostly on marbled murrelet, but that's been going on for a number of years, and don't know if you all took a look at that as a way of getting. It's it's more near shore than than uh, we're used to looking at the council, but still, it would be some regularly surveyed data for seabirds off the coast. Uh, thank you, Corey. The uh, the first question uh, on on groundfish. Uh, I think uh, we certainly could do what you're suggesting might be easier to do for the assessed species, uh, and there'd be some some uh, needing to do a little bit of uh, data uh, massaging there because some of the assessments are most recently 2007 and some are uh, most recently 2015, uh, but uh, that seems entirely doable. Uh, and I, I think, yeah, if, if we're able to, um, to produce some of those higher level kinds of statistics, um, Especially ones that summarize uh, community condition. Uh, that that certainly is a is a is a good thing. We are we are certainly constrained by the number of pages, the number of plots, and uh, and and I think fairly so that we can present because uh, at some point maybe you all experienced this in my uh, webinar. In fact, uh, we can definitely overwhelm an audience with numbers and uh, and the effectiveness of what we're trying to communicate uh, drops. Like a rock, if if we're overwhelming them with numbers, but uh, but uh, solutions like aggregate statistics might be a, a very good one. Uh, as far as the uh, murrelet uh, survey, if uh, let me see if if Tom Good is on, if he's aware of that and wants to comment on it. Yes, he is on. Uh, can can you unmute Tom Good, please? He's unmuted now. Tom, would you like to comment? Tom, we cannot hear you if you just asked that. Well, uh, in the interest of, of keeping things uh, moving, um, we'll, uh, we'll check in with Tom and see if uh, if the Murlet data um, 
uh, surveys um, is available, and if uh, if there are um, you know if there's value, if there are concerns, it's, and so on and so forth, how those data uh, wise would match up with what we've got. Uh, I do see Tom Good uh, was coming through at least some noise from his microphone. Are you are you there? Maybe uh, we'll see if Tom Good can come down to my office and uh, and and join here. I'll just queue up the. Um, while we're waiting, um, one thing I think, uh, looking at this plot of the, the ground fish, I would say we will probably look at the possibility of having three different here, with one just flat fish, a second with just rock fishes and thorny heads, and a third with surf fish. Uh, it doesn't look as much like, you know, a, a bag of candy got spilled on the floor, <laughs> but, um, but I, I think that will be easier on everyone's eye and, and brain. Uh, so Tom Good uh, is uh, here and uh, can comment on the marbled murelet uh, survey if, if he knows about it that Corey Niles asked about. I do. <laughs> Chris and um, Tom. Chris and Tom. I don't know what Chris just did to get extremely loud, but um, you're. I didn't do loud. anything. Okay. Is he extremely loud? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, um, this is Tom. Yeah, so yes, we're aware of the of the marble merlet surveys, the the WDFW surveys, and uh, we don't have our hands on them. Um, with the seabirds, it's always particularly difficult um, to uh, get our hands on the data sets. They're they're because of proprietary issues. It just depends on whether or not people or can play well with others, um, and so uh, that's an issue in particular that I that I run into a lot for uh, seabird data that that isn't collected by our agency. Not that people are difficult necessarily, but it but there are some impediments to um, you know, producing data and sharing it before they even get a chance to and things like that. But I am working um, uh, with other agencies and academics whenever possible and so and I know Scott Pearson at WDFW so he's sort of on the list of people to ping about um, additional indicators. This is Corey. Thanks Tom and yeah there, yes you people are difficult sometimes. I know Scott, <laughs> Scott I don't think Scott is one of them and I ask because we just went we're going through a marine spatial and I don't mean to overly focus on this issue here but uh, we've gone through marine spatial planning mapping um, project and we, I know they stitched together um, not uh, surveys and that weren't regularly run, but with our survey, so the data has been shared. And yeah, if you need help with that, um, please let us know. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This is Yvonne. I just wanted to comment. I think the other sort of wrinkle in birds is not just what information is available to us, but what kind of indicator would be useful to us. Um, and by that, I mean, is there a species that um, has a lot of interactions with the fisheries, either maybe as bycatch or um, that competes with some of the species that we manage for food? You know, if it's a bird that is eating stuff that we don't manage and it's a very near shore species then um, maybe it's not as important to us. So at any rate I think that's something that we might want to talk a bit about for the species that are not managed by the council. Yeah I think it's um, incumbent upon us to, to make sure that the indicators are yeah, are indicating something, and yeah, some may be lagging indicators, some may be leading indicators, um, and uh, yeah, some of that stuff is just being is being worked out now. Where they're, um, yeah, I'm going to a workshop next week that's on seabird fisheries competition, so uh, people are thinking about it, but it's it may not be well enough developed to implement 
quite yet, but as, as we get a little further along, um, make use of some of those indicators. There's a, there's a nice little there's subtlety, a nice I think, subtlety, I think, what Yvonne just asked and the way uh, Tom responded that I think it's, it's always good to be reminded of with something like seabirds is it'd be easy to look at, say, this plot that's on the screen and say that um, this is an indicator of the population abundance of city shearwaters. So you could, on the one hand, think of this as uh, an indicator of how good conditions are for city shearwaters. And a lot of people, even in a council context, might think, well, that's interesting, but it's not really relevant to the council. Uh, but, uh, but the abundance of sooty, sooty shearwaters could instead be looked at as an indicator of predation pressure on the rest of the system or as an indicator of the availability of food that both sooty shearwaters eat and that other uh, target species eat uh, so forth. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not just that this is an indicator of city shear water abundance, but it's also an indicator potentially of overall ecosystem condition that's meaningful to council managed species. And uh, it really depends on uh, how the indicator is being applied uh, as to um, and, and how, uh, what mechanisms we think of are connected to the indicator and how we interpret it. So uh, uh, just a little that's important to remember. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to see if we had any comments or questions specifically from any of the council's advisory bodies other than the ecosystem work group. I didn't want to cut off anyone from the work group, but if there was anyone from other advisory bodies who had some ideas that they wanted to share, um, that would be great to hear from them. Okay, well, if okay, Kit well, hasn't if seen any has raised seen hands, hands, then we'll just assume that you're cogitating. Uh, Richard Scully did, has had his hand raised. He is on the EWG, of course. But uh, Richard, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, I definitely would defer to uh, advisory group or body questions, but it does not sound like there is any at this moment. So <clears throat> I wanted to... Uh, ask about the zooplankton community composition. Um, the sampling that's done at, at, at Newport, it's, it sounds to me like that's the most northern uh, sampling area for uh, really detailed zooplankton um, uh, s sampling. Is, would it not be valuable to have uh, another line of zooplankton samples uh, further north, north of the Columbia River or up towards uh, uh, just the northern part of the, of, of the area that, that we study? Or is, is, that, a very, is that a very good, um, good is, it, is, it, is it reasonable to assume that that one line of information applies well to uh, the next several hundred miles north? Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, if uh, if Kelly Andrews is on, I saw his name and and would like to uh, to weigh in on this. That would be that would be good uh, if you could unmute Kelly. I will say that uh, the context of uh, of uh, asking Kelly to comment is uh, we in the IEA group, led by Kelly, uh, did a project for the state of Washington to look at ecosystem indicators uh, off of the Washington coast in uh, the context of marine spatial planning. And uh, because the Newport line was the nearest uh, line of data to the south, and then line P off of the west coast of Vancouver Island was the nearest really consistent uh, tracking line to the north, uh, we were stuck in the middle uh, and had to determine if either one of those lines of data was going to be useful for uh, indicating what the conditions off of Washington the coast were like. Uh, and Kelly, if you're on, would you like to take it from there? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Um, yeah, I guess there's a couple couple answers. Um, first, there are, there are zooplankton data 
from, um, I guess, Rick Brodeur and, and Cheryl Morgan's crews, the BPA plume survey. Um, I believe I mean, that, that time frame is it's about, oh, I think it's eight to ten years now, maybe, maybe more now. I can't remember the exact timeline. Um, but that data has been used, and there's there's a a paper that shows the plankton community from those surveys, which go you know there's probably five or six lines in in Washington State waters. Um, those lines show really good agreement uh, with the Newport line, and so there's pretty good evidence that what you see along the Newport line is, is also seen off Washington waters. Um, but again, there's also, <clears throat> there is data, and it's just a shorter time scale, or it's, just, it's a shorter time period than what you see for the Newport line. The Newport line, obviously, you know, goes back to 96, 97, um, and the, the data from the BPA plume survey Cruises, um, I believe, goes back to 2005, but I, I, I may be remembering that wrong. So there is data; it, it could be it could be used, but there's also good evidence that what you see in Newport um, is also seen off the coast of Washington. Well, thanks. That's 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 reassuring. It doesn't sound like you need to start a new data set then. Correct. Uh, and I apologize. I forgot to uh, to label the x-axis here. I believe the uh, the both of the time series we're looking at here go from approximately 1995 or six to uh, just the beginning of 2015. So sorry for that. Uh, and uh, again, thank you, Kelly. the The other thing that uh, is um, is heartening in this is that to the south of the Newport line, off of uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Trinidad uh, Head, uh, Eric Bjorkstedt at the Southwest Center and uh, also at uh, uh, Humboldt State, I believe, is uh, engaged in getting a similar, and has been for a couple years now, uh, getting a similar line to the Newport uh, study uh, going uh, on, on that line too, uh, so that uh, dynamics uh, to the south uh, are covered. And there's certainly a good reason to assume that there would be some variability between, or some differences between Newport and Trinidad Head. So. So uh, we're, coverage is certainly getting better. But uh, the time series that Bill has selected are, are, uh, are uh, uh, ex extremely um, valuable and unique. Yeah. OK, so in the interest of efficiency, um, how are we doing in terms of questions? Are we um, are folks feeling like they've had a good chance to ask questions of the Science Center? Do we have more? Are we looking at wrapping up? Yvonne, I had a couple other questions. This is Deb, but I was hoping we were going to hear from some of our other participants, so I've been kind of waiting. Well, uh, Deb, how about if you please go ahead then and um, We'll, uh, Kit will monitor hand raising as we go on. OK. Um, Chris, I, I'm struggling with one thing here, which is I see you have the, uh, for marine mammals, you have the sea lion pups for Southern California. But because there are no forage indicators for Southern California, which is actually my bigger question. Um, you know, I, I, I'm struggling to figure out how this is actually very useful um, for this particular indicator. But what to me, like I said, what a bigger question is, is I'm struggling to understand why there are no forage indicators for Southern California, because that's clearly a large part of the, the ecosystem. And we have a data set that goes back 40 years, which makes me wonder why there's nothing in there that can be used as forage indicators. I know we're off mute. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Deb. This is Greg Williams. Um, we actually do have a third um, 
time series based on the CalCoffee data. And that's been compiled. And it's, again, it's, it's not exactly comparable to the others. Obviously, we know the different sampling regime, regimes. But we do compile um, larval fishes. And um, you're right. In fact, I think it's on page. Chris, you want to drag that over there? Can you see? Uh, can you see the plot that I just uh, pulled over onto this screen? So it includes, yeah, a, a number of species: short belly rockfish, sand dab, jack mackerel, hake, sardine, anchovy. This this report that were that is on this. I hope. Can you see this? Uh, these new data. Yeah, yeah. these go well, all the way back to the 50s. So yeah, this is these are Cal <laughs> Coffee data. Um, I would assume it's this is from a 2012 report, which is is partly why uh, the the data uh, cut off when they do, uh, and uh, that is a terrific uh, observation. And we will uh, see if we can get those data into the uh, the uh, upcoming report. Uh, I don't know actually uh, if it's Sam McClatchy well, or who who is it's uh, Andrew. Um, I'm forgetting his last name. Thompson. Andrew Thompson. Okay. Andrew Thompson, and there is a slight delay because I think of processing associated with with those samples. Um, but he has assured me actually that's one of the, the people I'm following up with tomorrow um, for that time series. But that's a great point, Deb. Thank you, Deb. The same, uh, in the same, I think, uh, uh, apply that uh, we mentioned before. That, uh, we mentioned before. Important to view these as relative changes that are regional and uh, and healthy uh, in comparing region against region because the methods are different. But uh, the the bottom line here is that giving a good picture, we hope, of feeding conditions for predators uh, and the uh, link between the productivity at the base of the food web and the uh, the target species and predators up at the top. Well, just to follow up on that point. It, it kind of made me wonder, in some cases, whether for some of the oceanographic and, and physical indicators, whether there's a reason to, in where it's possible, to have uh, the scale of geographic scale of those map more closely match some of the forage indicators. Um, you know, there was so much echo. I don't know if you got that question or not. <laughs> I, this is Greg, um, and I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna ask if Elliot might want to respond to that because we've been talking about adding to some of our the web plotting tool, and in some of our future analyses, we're we're attempting to get a um, a grip on sort of the relevance of scale and the correlations between some of these indicators and and some of the um, how we how we break up sort of the spatial scale on the West Coast. Um, so uh, maybe met, I, I might ask Elliot to say something, and maybe Corey Green, if he if he uh, is available. Yeah, this is Elliot. Um, I would just say quickly that I think we are still kind of in the very beginning stages because. I, I think the point is spot on is that we do need to examine this, but we just haven't haven't dug too far into it. And as Greg mentioned. The web plotting tool is really going to be one of the things that will allow us to do that. So you could basically envision a map that will show all of the various data points. So if you have a time series, you can know exactly what scale that's collected over. And then that way you can basically relate it to other variables at the same scale or look at it you know, kind of in comparison. But that's also something that we've been developing in addition to doing all of our other IA tasks. So it's unfortunately slower than we'd like. Uh, this is Toby, if I could also add to that. Uh, Deb, I think it's a really good question, and I think it's an um, extremely important area where, where the IA team and the council members uh, can work together. Um, one problem with the Cal Coffee data is that they are pretty far behind in some of the analyses. So it's, it, you know, as I said the other day, um, if we do a full report, we're already two years behind, and yet if we're five years behind on counting some of these, then they don't make a very powerful uh, indice to use for uh, management type purposes. So there's, there's, I think, two things here. One is the delay in getting some of these data processed, but the other is 
the opportunity to really work with council members on what's the best way to present this information. And, and then this is maybe a, Chris Harvey again, maybe this is an area where the utility of the sea lion pups uh, indicator is, uh, is, is demonstrated that uh, if you assume that uh, and as I believe the marine mammal ecologists like Sharon Malin, who is our marine mammal point person, uh, have concluded that uh, that what we see here reflects, uh, as I'm sure you all well know, that um, um, uh, nursing mothers uh, are having to spend more time at sea looking for uh, abundant forage that uh, is also uh, high enough quality for them to produce fatty milk. Uh, and if they're having to spend more time at sea to find uh, those prey, uh, then it's possible that the pups are getting fed less or that the pups are um, abandoning the beach to go look for their mothers uh, and subsequently are, are washing up uh, or beaching uh, somewhere else. Uh, so uh, while uh, we are uh, awaiting the, the, uh, the other data uh, and, uh, and development of correlations between, say, uh, remotely tracked oceanographic data uh, and um, forage uh, data, uh, this is, uh, a, we hope, a good standby for uh, the feeding conditions off of uh, the Southern California Bite. Therese uh, Schmidt, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Kit. Uh, I just had a question about um, using stock assessment uh, results for uh, time trends. One of the ideas that was proposed, I believe, in the slide about uh, new indicators for CPS and HMS uh, included maybe consideration of stock assessment results for those indicators. And when we were just speaking a, a few minutes ago, there were some indicators shown for sardines and mackerel and various CPS species. And I think there needs to be maybe some distinction between survey results and some, uh, you know, more analytical results that are presented as uh, temporal trends and the assumptions that go with both those. Um, for the you know, assessment results, oftentimes there's changes in modeling or sources of information that are incorporated as as the data sets improve and our understandings improve. And with each new assessment, there's usually a hindcast of what the um, past looked like in terms of stock assessments and abundances of species. And so I was wondering how um, the team was utilizing assessment information if indeed there's a change in that historical view each time we update something. Thank you, Cyrus. Uh, the I think the preference would certainly be uh, to use empirical data where where possible, rather than um, um, using model output as an indicator uh, for a wide variety of, of reasons, uh, including the, the ones that you mentioned. As far as I know, the only uh, instance where we're using uh, indicators that are derived directly from assessments currently is in ground fish uh, and um, uh, in, in part I, I think that's uh, because it, it does enable us uh, to um, say something about the, uh, the, the best estimates of the status and condition uh, of, of the stocks in terms of things like the age structure uh, uh, the uh, maturity of, of females and also uh, yeah, incorporate some spatial dynamics into it. But, uh, but I think you're right that the, the more we can rely on empirical data, uh, the, the better off we are. Um, so that's, that's a, an important distinction. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly and uh, we will do uh, uh, more diligence to make sure that it's distinct when we're using uh, assessment data versus empirical data. And uh, I will take this comment also back to the IEA group as a whole to make sure that we're uh, in agreement and, and prepared to justify why uh, we use assessment uh, results in some cases and empirical in others. But thank you very much for that observation. It's very important. Yeah, thank you. It, it wasn't a, meant as a criticism. It was more just so I understand and, and that it becomes clear uh, when, when we're using one or the other and the assumptions and so on. 
Uh, well, if it's a criticism, it's a constructive one, so that's fine. That's fine. Uh, this is Corey Niles again. Um, Chris, I think you can you can kind of hear those of us on the working group um, trying to trying to balance ideas around here. I guess the, the greater goal is not to understand the, the weeds on these indicators, but really try to to figure out how we connect these to um, the conservation and management goals that the council and, and, and the cares about the public cares about, et cetera. So I think you can you can. In one sense, our stock assessments, they really are just very sophisticated indicators that are very focused on our, our overfishing and, and optimum yield goals. Um, and, and for the rest of these, I, don't know how, um, I kind of asked you the similar question on the last call, but how, what do you think, from your point of view, what, what, what do you guys need to know on the IEA team for us to better connect um, these indicators to what the council cares about? Reverse. What are you hoping people? Um, what do you think people from from our side could be telling you? What what kind of things do you want to know from us? Um, what kind of do you need to find out to better map these indicators to to what the council is working on? Corey, I'm very glad you asked that. And in fact, uh, based on the last call, I I prepared a couple of slides just for this particular discussion. Uh, and so I, I think one of the conversations that seemed to be happening in the last call was uh, the idea of how the council might actually use uh, some of the ecosystem indicators uh, because uh, you know t uh, the, the ones that Toby presented were uh, I think very clear-cut in people's minds but uh, but it's not always easy to, to see how uh, taking a, a, a trend might uh, or a, an indicator might connect directly to management. Uh, so if you ask the question of how the council might use indicators, the answer is actually the council is already using them. Uh, the, the example uh, would be the sardine uh, harvest control rule. Uh, so what I've done here is just a, a really simple stickman flowchart of, of the process uh, illustrated with the sardine example where uh, first what we would want to do is establish a relationship between an indicator and an attribute of interest. And this is one of the ways that we the IEA team and you, the council, uh, council bodies can collaborate is to define the attributes of interest. An attribute of interest could be uh, simply, you know, uh, the, the, the condition and the health, if you will, of a population. Uh, it can be some uh, serious management concern that's going on, uh, uh, like bycatch or something like that. Uh, it can even be an economic or a more social attribute, like uh, the um, uh, number of jobs in a coastal port, uh, a coastal port, a port, sorry about that, <laughs> redundant. Uh, so we need to have those kinds of conversations to come up with the attributes of interest uh, and some idea of what kind of management levers are associated with them and what the targets are, what the goals are for management to get a certain attribute to a certain level that's desirable. So in the case of sardines, the relationship of interest uh, is between sea surface temperature, SST, and sardine production. Uh, and, um, and that relationship uh, was, uh, was uh, hashed out very carefully in the council pro uh, pro process uh, through examining a lot of data, through examining models and running those models uh, through the review of the scientific and statistical committee. Uh, and, and so forth, uh, so establishing that relationship. The next step would be uh, to develop some kind of decision rule uh, based on the relationship. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that would be the council's uh, responsibility uh, and, that, uh, and that it would be information that the IEA could then uh, take and, and use in future uh, uh, tool development. Uh, the uh, example from sardines is that the decision rule, uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, allowable fishing pressure, was based on a statistical relationship uh, that included temperature, the, the T there. Um, and so when temperatures uh, on this uh, are forced this relationship to certain points, then uh, management rules would kick in and still do. The next step is that the IEA and other monitoring uh, groups uh, track those indicators and, um, and use those uh, indicator results uh, to drive those management actions. So we would be looking at tracking temperature for use in harvest control. So, um, you know, is it, is it cool? 
is it uh, maybe a little uh, different from average or is it very different from average uh, in, in these kinds of, uh, of, of temperature conditions. Uh, and then, of course, you would also want to be tracking the indicators of sardine abundance to make sure that they were still adhering uh, to the, the uh, relationships you'd established, tracking landings of sardines to see how close you were uh, to the ultimate uh, allowable catch goals. Uh, and then from time to time, you would want to reassess uh, this relationship periodically and see if it's uh, holding up or if it needs any kind of adjustment. And again, an example from the sardines might be uh, the decision to change from the Scripps uh, sea surface temperature to the Cal Coffee sea surface temperature uh, to improve that relationship uh, and the effectiveness of that, of that prediction. Uh, so things that we might want to take from the presentation that I've given today uh, and discuss further uh, would be um, uh, ways that, you know, identifying ways that we can collaborate. Um, and uh, some of the ways that indicators are already being used in, in the collaboration that we've already developed is for us uh, to come to the council every year and give a general overview of the context or the state of the system. The more interesting thing that I think gets to Corey's question is, are there management questions out there that could have uh, some kind of ecosystem relationship uh, with them? And uh, can we identify uh, relationships like thresholds or triggers that might be relevant to management. So ex a, a, an example earlier from the northern copepod biomass anomaly and, and salmon production where uh, this is a, a, an intriguing relationship. Uh, it would take a lot of work uh, with people like Brian Burke, Bill Peterson, uh, and the, the SSC and others to, de to determine if there is a, uh, a management ready uh, application of this relationship and for how many different stocks uh, it would it would be um, um, appropriate for under uh, if there are other conditions that would modify this at all, so on and so forth. Uh, and and then you could put this kind of relationship potentially once uh, all the uh, the concerns were vetted back into a relationship like this one, uh, where um, where this uh, copepod biomass anomaly was informing management in some way. And you can imagine other indicators that were talked about by Toby uh, or, or by uh, us here today, uh, such as physical drivers that might correlate with protected species distributions that could result in, say, bycatch of turtles, entanglement of whales, bycatch of birds, uh, and uh, also indicators that might help track management effectiveness. So uh, if a management action is put into place, uh, we want to know if that management action is effective. Uh, do we have indicators uh, out there that are tracking the effectiveness of the management action? So these are the kinds of things I think that are, are most important for us to work out with the council advisors and with the EWG, which is what are the uh, really driving concerns uh, and decision rules that are in place that might involve some kind of ecosystem uh, variable that we can help out with, uh, and also what are management actions that are in place that you're most keen to know uh, their effectiveness. And, uh, and again, I want to reiterate that this can be an ecological indicator uh, of effectiveness or a social or economic indicator of effectiveness, and we'll talk more about those in, um, or, a, 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 or a habitat uh, indicator. We'll talk more about those in the coming webinars. Uh, and that, I think, uh, there's a very long answer to your question, but uh, I hope uh, by answering it, it in this way and illustrating it like this that we've uh, clarified a little bit the purpose of why we look at these indicators and also maybe um, got your creativity and your, uh, your ideas firing on ways that we could uh, serve a, a really hands-on uh, purpose uh, in supporting you uh, and the council in, in getting your, your work done. Thanks for that added um, effort on your part, Chris. I think that was really helpful. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chris. I think that was a very, very awesome answer. But uh, so just to clarify, you're not, you're not, you're saying, you know, we should really, in the ideal world, um, we'd have these quantified relationships that can be linked to a harvest control rule and go through all the vetting of the SSC. But you're still saying there's some value you, you still think and giving the annual report of what's just the general conditions and what, what ecologists and ecosystem scientists are seeing out there, you're saying that's 
still a valuable thing in your mind for the council to hear about as well. Yeah, I think so because I mean, even even in a, in an ideal uh, situation where we might get a nice strong relationship that informs management, like the sardine rule did, uh, it's not always going to be the case uh, for species that are, let's say, data poor species uh, or species that are maybe uh, you know much more uh, widely distributed uh, or that monitoring is difficult um, to to do in a fishery independent kind of way, so that we can get good. Uh, uh, robust data to look at. So if if the general context state of the system, the state of the California current report that we give each March uh, is along the lines of what uh, we talked about in 2015, where it was clear that um, the anomalous warm conditions, uh, the anomalous um, precipitation levels and other things were in general contributing to a system that did not look like it would support uh, strong population uh, growth and condition of a lot of species, uh, even if there's not a nice, uh, uh, pretty uh, data relationship uh, available for this for a stock like uh, is presented here or in the sardine case, the council would still be able to use the information we've provided in some something of a precautionary way that they might know. Well, because uh, we've heard that conditions in general are very poor this year. Uh, we uh, should take that into consideration when we decide on um, total um, uh, allowable catches. Uh, or if, uh, on the flip side, if there happen to be very good conditions indicated by um, copepod uh, numbers or, or sea surface temperatures or upwelling or something like that, then uh, they might uh, conclude that, uh, that conditions are more amenable uh, to production of, of target species. So. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of value, I think, still in uh, giving a, a general report card, uh, state of the system uh, report. I'm going to just back off a second here and see if Toby wants to uh, add anything to that as my, my co- if, if I'm, I'm sorry, Toby, if you have something urgent, but I, I just wanted to, this is Yvonne, I just wanted to jump in and note that um, the, the annual report, of course, provides information about the sort of full suite of species of interest to the council plus more um, physical conditions, socioeconomic conditions, and uh, thinking for the future, um, habitat indicators and whatnot. Um, but we should remember, and this might be something to talk about with the council, that March is not a meeting where the council commonly makes any of those decisions on how much of which species are going to be harvested when and where. It's it's more of a sort of thinking about the future meeting and then um, final harvest decisions for the different fishery management plans, of course, are made in other meetings and they're not all made at the same meeting. So I just wanted to note that in there. Yvonne, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, this is an, definitely another area of collaboration is uh, the, the more education that the IEA team can get into the, the, the general operating uh, procedures of the council, the better, uh, 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 because otherwise we're uh, potentially providing the right information at the wrong time or what, however you want to put it, but that's super valuable. This is Richard. Uh, in that last discussion, um, is, is that leading to trying to have some uh, like like mini reports or ones that are not quite so comprehensive that are more specific to the species that are being considered at one at each particular meeting? You know, we talked about that, if you recall, uh, way back in the day when we were the ecosystem plan development team. That was something we had laid out before the council, and they were not sure whether they wanted to do that. Um, well, they were definitely sure they didn't want to do that at that time. Um, and maybe they will change their minds um, if we mention it again as a possibility. Uh, I think it sounds like that you may have heard, um, shoot, who was it? Oh, I'm sorry. 
um, one of the representatives from the Science Center talking about this web-based tool that they're developing. So there's, you know, through the fishery ecosystem plan process, we have this annual report to the council, and it's, you know, sort of the usual paper document, but the centers are also working on a giant um, web interface where folks can pull up different bits of information about their favorite species or species group at any time. So um, that might also be something that would be of interest to the council and its advisory bodies. So in the interest of time and for the good of the order and all that sort of thing, and uh, again, I don't want to quash any discussion that folks want to have, but I also want to be um, respectful of others' time. How are we doing in terms of discussions? Uh, do, does anyone have any further questions? Um, there's going to be plenty of time for you to sort of let this sink in and think about it, um, and, but I want to make sure we do get questions while we have our scientists on the line, um, and but also um, not drag this out if, if folks are, are ready to finish up. This is Kit. I don't see any hands raised. All right, then. Uh, if you have a last hand raising, please do so. Otherwise, I think we will wrap up. And we're going to have a little bit of a break in that next week we have no webinars. But the next webinar is on Tuesday, January 26th. Again, it will start at 1.30. And uh, that one is on human dimensions indicators and sort of so human well-being and socioeconomic indicators and then on Thursday we get into the what for us is a new area habitat indicators um, the um, the council had asked us to think about habitat indicators specifically um, at the recommendation of their habitat team so we want to make sure that we get in touch with anyone who's interested in the essential fish habitat side of things or the critical habitat side in the council management process and make sure that they are aware that this that the Thursday session on 28 the January 28th is going on and then our final uh, webinar is on Tuesday February 2nd and this also is getting into new areas for us, uh, risk assessments and application of indicators to decision making. So I think we're going to see a little more exploration of what Chris was talking about there towards the end. And with that, making sure one last time that we have no raised hands, I want to again thank everyone for participating, particularly for our Science Center folks who joined us and um, thank the ecosystem work group members for uh, participating and asking lots of great questions and also ecosystem work group folks if you could um, and Chris and Toby maybe just stay on the line for a couple minutes in case we have any um, technical issues we want to talk about for the next session on the 26th.